Cyberpunk 2077 Shadowrunners. Chapter 1, Baja. Scene 1, The Ripper Dock. The sun was a fierce, unrelenting presence in the sky, its heat bearing down on the small border town like a physical weight. The air shimmered with the promise of mirages, the horizon blurring the line between reality and illusion. It was a place where secrets came to die, where the lost and desperate sought refuge from the long arm of the corporates. V and Pan Am moved through the streets with a cautious urgency, their eyes constantly scanning their surroundings. The town was a labyrinth of narrow alleys and decrepit buildings, a patchwork of lives lived on the edge. The occasional sound of a distant gunshot or the whir of a drone overhead served as a reminder of the constant threat that lurked just beyond the shadows. Okay, so I'm not going to read the entire chapter because um, that would be spoilers. But um, I have had people ask me to do a review of Claude 3. This was written by Claude 3 with no editing on my part. So I had arguments with some of my friends a year or two ago. They said, oh, well, you know, GPT is can't write. It's bad at fiction. Therefore, you're a bad writer. And I'm like, well, I mean, just because it requires editing and refinement doesn't mean that, you know, blah, 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 what you think it means. But what I'm here to tell you now is that Claude 3 is above the level of most writers. So I'm a member of several writing groups, both online and in person. And this is this is well above the the level of most amateur writers. And the the quality of this is about probably what would be a third, fourth, or fifth draft for me. And um for for some context, my novel that's about to come out is on draft 14. Um, so you get all the big pieces in place and then you polish it and polish it and polish it. If you ever watch any of those like restoration videos online where it's like first you like scour all the rust off and then you polish it with 200 grit and then 500 grit and then 2000 grit, like that's kind of what it's like, uh, refining prose to get it to a point where it's actually really tightly written and compelling with a lot of details in it. Pretty, it's in pretty good shape. Like I said, this is a roughly equivalent to about a fifth draft for me. Um, and I showed it to my wife as well, who's also a, a prodigious reader and a writer. And she said, like, yeah, it's very obviously fanfic. Um, but, right, it's like it tells the story. It it does a really good thing um, with, uh, with details, dialogue, exposition, once it gets to know the characters. So let me walk you through how I did this. So after watching Phillips uh, over on AI explain his great breakdown of Claude three and just kind of doing a deep dive in more of the technical things. I said, you know what, let me give this another try. Cause the first time I tried this fanfic, I was doing it with Claude two and it was only able to write very short scenes. And when I say short scenes, I mean three to 400 words before it would give up. And that's not long enough to be a good scene. So most chapters, uh, a chapter is generally between one and five scenes, usually one, two or three scenes. And a good good length chapter is a rule of thumb is around two thousand to five thousand words. My chapters are usually around three thousand words, uh, so that's usually two or three or maybe four scenes per chapter. And so that's the first lesson that I want to give you is that the best way to use this is instead of asking uh, Chat GPT or Claude three in this case um, to write an entire chapter at once, ask it to write a scene at a time. Um, and because if it tries to write the whole chapter, it'll it'll you know rush through it and then try and tie it off with a bow nice and neat. And it does that all the time anyways. Um, I don't know if that's just because I told it that it's fanfic because as my wife was reading it, she's like, oh, at the end of every scene or chapter, it's like, you know, uh, hope and friendship will carry us through the day, which is really like that is that is a that is a quintessential sign of an amateur writer. And but it's also kind of a, a, a genre staple in fanfic um, because it tends to be written kind of episodically. So let me just walk you through the conversation, how I staged it all, and I'll explain why I prompted it in this way. So first I just said, tell me about Cyberpunk 2077, specifically the story. The reason that I started here is just to go ahead and prime it in a way that, oh, I'm just expressing curiosity. Um, Cause in the past, and I haven't tested it, but in the past, if you would ask uh, chat or uh, Claude about uh, like, what do you know about this thing? It would go into a, a refusal. And it would just, I don't know anything about that that copyrighted work. Um, and then it would double down on that because if that was the initial response, it kind of gets stuck in a rut. And so I said, just tell me about it. Tell me what you know about it. And so um, if you if you invoke the agent model, if, if I say, what do you know about it as a model, that will 
trigger some trip lines. Again, I don't know if they fixed that. Uh, according to the data, it has far fewer false refusals. Um, but either way, um, you you get the ego out of it. And humans are actually kind of the same. Because if I ask you or a friend, like, what do you know about Cyberpunk 2077? That activates the default mode network, which brings the self into it. But if you just say, hey, let's talk about Cyberpunk, then you're talking about something outside of the self. And I'm not saying that AI psychology is the same as human psychology, but if you uh, if you do some tests around whether or not the conversation invokes the agent model, and when I say agent model, I mean what does the model think about itself? What does it know about itself? What it has what has it been trained to say about itself? You're going to get different behaviors. And I did some experiments about this back in the day when testing my heuristic imperatives, where if you use if you use the definitive article I and you, you get very different. Uh, results than if you say we and our. Um, so if you use like the royal we when prompting, it is intrinsically more inclusive and that also changes the relationship to the agent model. So anyways, and it just gives me some basic, you know, blah, blah, blah. Here's the story. And so this is, this is good because now it says, okay, I've got the story in mind. And so then I gave it some, uh, some of the Canon decisions that I made. So this is just a text file that I keep in my, uh, in my books document and I said, so here's the canon story from my playthrough, and it asks me some questions, um, some clarifying questions, and then I gave it some more, uh, some of the some of the notes, some of the outlines that I made for the fanfic that I'm working on, um, and it said, you know, here's here's a lot of the answers that you want, um, and so there's th these documents came from you see this 329 lines, um, let's see if I can open it. There we go. Um, so you see, like I just went through, I gave it a lot of information about kind of the, you know, all the different characters that I wanted and some of the main plot beats and that sort of stuff. This again was, was developed in, in part, uh, with help with chat GPT and Claude, um, just for brainstorming really. Uh, if you ask, so here's the thing, if you ask these models to just write for you, it'll write really generic stuff. And that, that I agree with, like, if you just sit in front of it and say, write me an epic story about blah, it'll give you, it, it looks like something that was written by committee or written by honestly a generic guild writer. And I dump on guild writers a lot because I mean, just look at what they did to the MCU. Um, that's also ex corporate executives and, and writing by committee. Um, I'm sure that guild writers on their own could probably churn out better stuff, but they frequently don't. Um, and that is me being snooty as an individual author. Uh, I will own that. So anyways, um, it, what it is good at though, is brainstorming. You say, Hey, this is kind of, you know, the story, the characters, the world, here's some of the plot lines, help me think through some of these details. And that is actually where it really shines because it can rapidly recombine ideas and kind of extrapolate forward really quickly. And the reason that I do that one, that activity, at least for me is very, very cognitively taxing where it's like, okay, Here's a whole bunch of details, a whole bunch of variables and characters and plot lines. Let me um, extrapolate out as far as I can. That's very, very cognitively demanding. But since I'm working with a generative model, the generative model is like, that's what it's here for. You just give it some stuff, you give it a prompt, and it's ready to run. And so you give it the right prompt, and it'll just run with it. And so that is, that is what is called cognitive offload. And so as a writer, and oh, by the way, I did not do any of this with my novel because I started my novel before GPT-2 was even out and GPT-3 was no help and chat GPT was no help. I was already a, far above where those models could help. And even Claude 3 today is not capable of helping with like the level of polish that my novel is at. Um, but this is fanfic, so the stakes are lower. <laughs> Um, so anyways, uh, fo followed that rabbit hole a little bit too much. Okay. So it's a generative model. The more context you give it, the better it will do. So this is one of the things that if you watch any like prompt engineering videos, context, 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 the more context you give it about what it is that you're trying to do. Here's some background information. Here's what I want to achieve. These models are better able to use that to kind of steer and plot a course. Um, and of course, also if you're not asking it to invent all of the details in one shot, it's going to do better. And so I actually had a conversation with a researcher recently where I pointed out science, creativity, whether you're, whether you're a scientist performing new physics or whether you're an author or a filmmaker, whatever, it's all iterative. And uh, I, this is probably nothing, to, nothing new because watching some of the other YouTubers out there talking about this stuff, it's iterative, right? You know, it, you know, let's think through this step by step. Let's refine this process over time, so on and so forth. 
So uh, this is actually pretty far into the process. And once I show you the, the document that I've, I've got, you'll see that it's draft version three. So I'm already on my third draft. And the way that I write, so if you're not a writer, you'll hear, you'll hear a term called uh, pantsers and plotters. And so plotters are ones that like, I need an outline. I need to know what all the chapters and all the scenes are before I even start writing. And then pantsers are people who just write by the seat of their pants. And I'm more of a pantser. And so what that means is I'll do a little bit of planning. I'll get a kind of a theory or an idea, and then I'll just start writing. And usually my first few drafts, I only get a, f a couple chapters in before I'm like, I'm stuck. This isn't working. And then I'll do it again. And so the way that I think about the way that I write a novel is like when you're watching Stable Diffusion or Mid Journey, where it's like it starts off really blurry, and then it does it again, and it gets sharper and sharper and sharper. That is exactly how I approach novel writing. Um, so with all that being said... This is the conversation where it's like, okay, let's start very vague, where I give it some ideas, I give it some notes, and then I just say, hey, you know, the plot's going to change. Um, here we go. Ask some questions about some of the plot beats that we were talking about. And so I think now would be a good time to take a step back and kind of give you my core thesis for this story. So if you've played Cyberpunk 2077, one of the endings that you can choose is that you leave Night City, you leave uh, the, the Cyberpunk hellscape. Um, with the nomads. And so the nomads are, it's basically like sort of like Mad Max, right? Where they, they're desert, desert living clans and some of the desert clans, like they go to war sometimes, sometimes they do raids, um, but you can befriend them and you can actually join them. And so in my playthrough, my canonical, personal canonical playthrough, um, it was female V, uh, leave with the Aldecaldos, uh, take Judy with you and you go in search of a new cure. Now, adding the Phantom Liberty DLC, there's a bunch of other new characters like Aguilar, the assassin, and Songbird, who's on the moon and is going to be helping you kind of as a deus ex machina kind of character who can come in and, and, and drive the plot forward a little bit every now and then. Yeah, so that's kind of the, the background. And then uh, here you see where I'm talking about kind of the, the, the overarching plot, which is you know, they're going to raid Militech to get some new implants for V. They're going to go to Biotechnica to get some new nano machines to help fix V's brain. And then they have to go to Netwatch to get a super powerful AI to reprogram all of V's uh, implants and stuff. And that's going to be how they save V. So that's the spoiler that you get. Um, now, there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen in between there. There's a lot of character tension. Judy hates the desert. Uh, v is dying. Oh, and also, by the way, Johnny comes back. Because depending on how you played it, played through it, Johnny can leave with Alt Cunningham. And so that's my canonical playthrough where uh, Johnny leaves with Alt. And so it's like, oh, V doesn't have Johnny, but V still has the relic. And so basically in, in this fanfic, the relic reboots and brings Johnny back. And so they have to start from scratch again, <laughs> which is really hilarious. And it actually handled that really, really well. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of source material. And if you're not a writer, actually developing that backstory, creating a rich world and a bunch of rich characters to play with, um, that is actually one of the hardest parts of writing. And that is why it has taken me almost five full years to work on my first novel. Cause I start, I was inventing all of this from scratch. Cyberpunk 2077 has, uh, when was the first tabletop game released? I think it was like 1983. So it's got almost 40 years of lore and canon and characters to work with, uh, which is one of the reasons that it's such a good story. This is another reason why, for instance, uh, Phase 1 and Phase 2 of the MCU, The Infinity War, was such a good story is because it had literally decades of source material to work with. And this is why some of the newer stuff that is just like, oh, we just wrote this, you know, a bunch of guild writers wrote this and, you know, cobbled it together from a few ideas, usually feels a lot thinner. Um, again, I'm going to dump on guild writers. I'm not usually impressed by them. I'm a snobby writer. That's fine. Anyways, so that's a little bit of background on kind of how all of this comes together and how it works. Um, I, I explained some stuff and, you know, then we talk about the, the main problems. Here's, I'd already told you about that, so we don't need to do that. All right. So now let's get down to where the writing starts. Oh yeah. So uh, before we did that, I said let's do let's do uh, let's brainstorm an outline based on the details that I gave. I use Save the Cat and Hero's Journey. So Save the Cat, if you're not familiar with um, with writing, this is a this is a formulaic approach that basically most screenplays follow today, um, and it is inspired by Hero's Journey, 
uh, which is by Joseph Campbell, and that's what you know underpins Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, that sort of thing. Save the Cat is a little bit more uh, geared towards specifically towards screenplays. Um, both of those are uh, more or less a three act structure, uh, and of course, there's four act and five act structures. Uh, you know, Shakespeare I think did what five act? I don't remember. Anyways, uh, but yeah, so there's fee- 15 key story beats in Save the Cat. Uh, which is can be good, can be bad. It, uh, again, if you follow it formulaically, it's going to be formulaic. <laughs> you have to know the rules well enough to break them and then know when and why to break them. And so then what I did was I gave it the, the previous draft, so draft 02, um, and I said, all right, so here's the first two chapters. Let's start there. Uh, and I said, let's write scene by scene. Um, and so then here's one of the things that I, that I told it very early on uh, right here was, Use a mixture of interiority, description, dialogue, action, and exposition all woven together. So these are all different subtypes of prose or different components or elements of prose. So interiority is when the character, when you're in the character's head and they tell you what they're thinking and what they're going to do and why and how they're reacting to a thing. Now, often uh, new writers will be told show, don't tell. And show, don't tell is like, that is some of the worst advice but the thing is, is amateur writers will do a lot of telling, which is basically narrator just kind of explains everything that's going on. Don't do the narrator voice. Instead, you use interiority so that the character says, so that you get in the character's head, you see things from their perspective, and you understand their motivations, their feelings, and that sort of stuff without being more like an omniscient narr- narrator. So interiority is actually really important. And if you read Dune, so Dune just came out, uh, Dune was actually kind of infamous because of all the head hopping and it was uh, it was a very omniscient perspective where you'd have everyone you'd know what was going on in everyone's head in a scene in the original uh, dune book which is one of the reasons that it's so hard to adapt to the screen is because unless you have like the whisperings right the the voiceover you have to show it in different ways and a lot of it is just kind of lost in translation so next up is description which this is the five senses uh, you know, smell, sight, touch, taste, and so on. Uh, though that is required to give you the sensory details to really anchor you into the scene, setting the scene, uh, addressing the scene, that sort of stuff. Dialogue, obviously, dialogue is people talking. Our brains find people talking very interesting. Action. Uh, so this is people have to do stuff. Someone moves from one room to another. And again, these are rules of thumb. There are authors and writers out there who do pretty much exclusively interiority exclusively dialogue, uh, exclusively exposition, that sort of stuff. But the best prose, um, and when I say the best prose, I mean stuff that I like personally and stuff that tends to sell well, uses a mixture. And so like, if you take any one page of a really good book and you take a highlighter and you say like, okay, interiority is going to be blue, description is green, dialogue is red, and so on, you're going to see it's going to look like a rainbow. It's going to look like a you throw a, a bag of Skittles at it. And that one, that forces you to vary sentence type and structure, which keeps it very interesting to the reader. Um, but it's also going to uh, give the reader little clues and details like right as they need it. Um, and that is that is another thing that makes the writing very engaging, but also getting that balance right takes lots and lots and lots of iteration, which is why, you know, it's like, okay, this writes at about, you know, fifth draft level, you got another 10 drafts before you get, get done. Okay. So I gave it some, some two, uh, the first two chapters. And then I said, okay, let's, let's go and, and refine this. Like what feedback do you have? So on and so forth. And then I was like, you know, I answered some of the questions. I said, all right, let's just rewrite chapter one. And so it took a first stab at it, and it was it was pretty bad. Um, it made a lot of assumptions. It confabulated, which, again, confabulation and imagination or creativity are the same thing. Um, when humans are being creative and innovative, that is just confabulation. And so this is one of the things that is really just kind of infuriating to me when people are like, these models aren't creative. They're not innovative. I'm like, how do you think your brain creates new things? You take a few data points. And you remix them, and then you create something new. Now, most of what humans create that is new, when we're being creative, when we're brainstorming, when we're imagining, it is confabulation. You create a new space, and then you figure out how to test it. And so in a scientific perspective, you can ask these models, 
uh, brainstorm some hypotheses, brainstorm some ways to test these, brainstorm some experiments. How do we get the data? What do we do? And then you go do the experiments and then you give it the data and help it interpret the data. So again, science, uh, whether it's science or writing a novel or whatever, it's all very iterative processes and breaking those cognitive steps down is the key. Most people don't have the metacognitive self-awareness to do that, um, which is one of the reasons that it's aggravating. Anyways, that is <laughs> all writers talk about this kind of stuff because we have to be hyper aware of what's going on in our own head in order to be good writers. Okay, so after this first one, I said this is a good start. The tone and pacing is great. A couple things to change. V doesn't know the Ripper doc. Pan Am does. So quick backstory. It uh, basically said like V walks in and introduces herself and makes demands. And I'm like, that's not, that's not the story. Um, so I just said, uh, there needs to be more dialogue as Pan Am explains the situation. We can also slow down and spend more time talking about the Arasaka patrols as that creates a sense of foreboding. Uh, but otherwise the length and style is good. And also you'll notice that this was more than 400 words. This is almost, uh, 700 words, which is good enough for an introductory scene. Um, and so that's it understood. Let's revise the scene. And then that gets to where we were. So with just just all that setup, just some context, some discussion, some brainstorming, uh, the scene was bad once, I gave it some feedback, and then it was good enough. It's good enough to get something on the page. So I was like, great, let's go to scene two. And so then I gave I gave it, again, enough details. I said, you know, Judy will be waiting impatiently. Several of the Aldos, namely Mitch, will be waiting warily. This will foreshadow the Aldo's impatience with Pan Am and V. So I'm giving it all the details that I want it to have. And then it it does it. Um, now, again, there's a little, it's a little bit heavy handed with the telling instead of showing. So it's like, here's an example. The Aldo's were a tight knit group. This, this is telling, not showing. Um, so this is more like the narrator voice. Um, but then here is where you actually give some, some relevant detail. The strain of their, their recent struggles was beginning to show the attack by the Raf and Shiv had let them left them bruised and battered. And the looming threat of Arasaka's patrols only added to the sense of unease that hung over the camp like a pall. So again, this is like almost there, but there's ways that you could show this without just being quite so heavy handed, but still like, this is not bad. And this is better than most amateur writers. And so then we get to Judy. Well, she demanded her voice tight. What did the Ripper doc say? Now, all language models have some go-to phrases. And and when you're writing fiction, Claude 3 wants to say everyone's voice is tight. So, you know, and all writers have that, really, honestly. All writers have go-to phases. Um, I think, what was it, Stephanie Myers? Like, people chuckled a lot. Um, so if you ever if you ever go back and reread the Twilight series, just, like, note every time someone says they chuckled. Um, and it's like a million times. It's not a, actually a million times, but you get the idea. But yeah, so V side, you know, running a hand through her hair, nothing we didn't already know. And so here's here's a, a good thing where it's not very formal writing. And so this is something about writing dialogue is that the way that the dialogue would be said on screen or the way that the dialogue would be said on a, on in a game is actually a little bit different than the way that dialogue is written because you don't want to have it be exactly how it would be said in real life. Um, so you gloss over some details and that's where you might hear the, the, the rule of thumb, like less is more. And so saying nothing, we didn't already know that's enough. Um, but this is also kind of, this is kind of realistic how people would actually talk because there's a lot implied. Um, trying to keep the weariness out of her voice, the relic's still killing me and there's no easy fix. Um, so then, you know, there has to be something we can do. We can't just give up all good enough. Okay. So here's a good example of. Uh, how it ends each scene as if you're like drawing the whole book to a close. The road ahead would be long and fraught with danger, but with Pan Am, Judy, and the Aldo Caldos by her side, she knew she could face whatever lay ahead. They were a family bound by love and loyalty, and together they would find a way to cheat death once again. This is hardcore, like complete tripe amateur writing. And no matter what I told Claude, like it would not stop doing this. I'm like, bro, this is the end of a scene not the end of a romance novel, <laughs> like stop doing that. And it just, it doesn't know how not to write this way. That could be part of the training data. So my wife and I suspect that, that uh, all of the training data used to train these models to write fiction comes from, you know, uh, fanfic basically. Uh, they're probably because like one, a lot of novels are not available because they're not in the public domain a lot of stuff that is in the public domain is fanfic or it's garbage. Um, there are very few things that are actually good in the public domain that can be used for training. And so when you say write a serious adult 
you know, fiction, it, this is all it knows because this is all that's in the training data. Um, now that being said, the rest of it is actually not bad. V step forward, her jaw set with determination. If it's a chance to save my life, I'll mess with whatever I have to. Like that's a, that's a good line. And that's like on, that's on brand. She said her voice brooking no argument. So that's a pretty interesting, like turn of phrase. Again, less is more. It's like, okay, you get the point. Let's move on. Mitch held up his hands in a placating gesture. Hey, I get it. I just want to make sure you know what you're getting into. This is a very, very realistic interaction, knowing those characters and knowing this world. Uh, <laughs> and then I won't read this one aloud for uh, censorship reasons, but you know, Mitch whistled low, shaking his head. Militech, that's some serious corpo stuff. You want to mess with that? So again, you see where it does do some of this really well. So moving forward, though, um, I... I said, okay, so we've really set the stage. The story really kind of picks up in the days or weeks immediately after uh, the events of the end of the game. And so we're with the Aldos, and so the first chapter is kind of like settling everything in. And here what I wanted to do was I wanted to add in a little bit more uh, tension between Judy and V. And so a lot of people talk about Judy, and they're like, I don't really understand Judy Um, Because, like, she's always angry or she's super emotional and she's super inconsistent. And I'm like, but the thing is, is she's super emotional. Like, that's all you need to know about her to understand why she seems inconsistent. So for some backstory of this character, if you're not familiar, she hated Night City. She all, All she wanted to do was leave. She wanted to leave the mocks. She wanted to leave clouds. She just wanted to get out there. And if you don't date Judy, she just bounces. She just leaves the city and like she'll text you once like I'm gone and then block you. <laughs> but if you're dating her, she'll stick around and and she has a lot of tension around this. She's like, I'd be gone if it wasn't for you. And so that's like, ooh, that kind of hurts, right? Like you're keeping her somewhere that she's miserable. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to play with that in the story because, yes, she wants to leave Night City, but being like a basement dwelling like porn brain dance editor and then going and living in the desert, that's actually kind of a step down for Judy. Like that's actually worse for her because she's a city slicker, right? She's, she's a big old softy. She's a city slicker. She just wants a nice quiet life with a you know white picket fence. Um, and so I was like, Ooh, this will be some really good character tension to play with. And so the third scene of this first chapter is, you know, Judy looks like a kicked puppy. Um, and someone says like, you know, whatever, I'm just trying to lighten the mood, blah, blah, blah. And it does a really good job with this, you know, grub time, I'm for dinner. And someone says like, she's having a tough time nodded towards Judy. It's not easy adjusting to this life. Um, in my canonical playthrough, V was already uh, a nomad. And so V for V, this is like going home. So V is with her people again and, and is, is happy and is, you know, got the family that she wants. She's out of night city She's got the allies that she needs to try and, you know, cure her problem with the relic. And now she's got Judy by her side, but Judy is not in good shape. And so that creates a lot of tension for those, you know, primary romantic interests. Why the long face? You look like a kicked puppy over there. And it's like, that's kind of a dick move. Um, Judy's head snapped up, her eyes flashing with anger and hurt. Without a word, she slammed her plate down and stormed off into the darkness. Perfectly on brand for Judy. Actually, she might she might have like yelled something like, "Ah, oh, you're such a pussy! Like, leave me alone." Um, but in this case, like, she's just on the edge of tears and she like leaves. And then Pan Am, being you know the firebrand, is like shot a glare at Flint, who held up his hands defensively. What he said, his voice tinged with confusion. I was just trying to lighten the mood. V stood, her jaw set with determination. Again, there's that go-to catchphrase: jaw set with determination. You'll see that a lot. I'll go talk to her. Um, so on and so forth. You can probably imagine how it how it pans out. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's my process. I don't want to do too many spoilers. Um, I'm three chapters in, um, and I will keep going. So this video has been a long time coming. I'll just talk about this for a little bit. It's been a long time coming because people have asked for months, more than a year now, like what's my process. And, uh, yeah, as I said, I signed up for, uh, Claude three, um, because it, it better. And I'm here to tell you, yes, as a, as a writer, as a semi-pro writer, who's got a big epic novel coming out, who's been doing the process for five years. Yes, it is there. It's ready. You still have to know how to use the tool and you still have to know the theory about like characters, about story, about plot, that sort of stuff. I can recommend some books if you want um, uh, in the comments or whatever. Um, and then, yeah, I'll end by just saying um, hop on over on my Patreon on the discord. I, com- I recently completely reorganized my discord. Let me show you real quick. 
So I use the forum features on Discord. So now we actually have a lot more conversations going. Um, so like here we're talking about Claude. Um, it's all the rage right now. And so basically, you know, I ran a poll the other day where I said like um, social media has gotten a lot more toxic. And then Kyle Hill actually posted a really great video talking about how, how AI is making the internet more fake and more toxic. So go watch that. And I'm like, yeah, like let's just focus on the cozy web. And so, like, we we talk about, you know, all of our neuro-spicy interests. We're talking about Legos over here. <laughs> um, we're talking about neuro-digital philosophy. So there's a, this is a cool thing where we're, we're basically debating, like, okay, how do we know when AI is going to be sentient? Um, then we talk about, you know, what's going on in China. Like, I mean, you know me. I have all kinds of interests, and I attract people with all kinds of interests. So basically what I'm trying to do here is make a private, gate-kept version of Reddit that the algorithm isn't going to be feeding you. It's going to be people with similar interests. So if you want to jump in, please feel free to do so. All the links are in the description. Hope to see you there. Cheers.